This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. My name is John Shigarian, and I'm so honored to have with us today, Ryan Holiday. He is one of the best-selling authors that we have today in the United States. This is his 12th book we're going to be talking about today, Courage is Calling. Ryan, welcome to the Impact Podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. You know, I'm not only a huge fan, I read your your Daily Stoic, and uh, you already have, at 34 years old, a huge body of work behind you. Uh, the obstacles away, ego is the enemy, daily stoic, stillness is the key. I mean, 4 million plus copies, New York Times bestseller at 34. What, you know, before we get talking about courage, going, what's, where did you grow up and and how did you even like get, get on this journey of uh, being this prolific writer? Well, I, I grew up in beautiful Sacramento, California, um, not a child of writers or really anyone. Uh, involved in anything sort of like this. My, my dad is a police officer. My mom was a school principal. Um, sort of ordinary civil servant kind of a family. And I just felt, I fell in love with books. I knew I wanted to do something around books. I wasn't sure if I could be a writer. I just knew that I loved reading and I wanted to do something very different than how my parents' lives were. I didn't want to go to an office. I didn't want to have a job. And uh, ended up here uh, through a variety of, uh, of uh, strange twists and turns. But I, I wrote my first book when I was 24, I think. So, you know, I, I do have a, a body of work behind me, but I also got started earlier than most. Uh, so it's some, somewhat un, unfair advantage. Right. Um, but, with, you know, what informed you? What, what made you a, such a bibliophile growing up? And what books informed you to say, this is maybe a path I'm interested in taking? Yeah, you know, I really loved books and I loved right. reading, but I didn't really get turned on into to, to the kinds of books that I like now until much later, probably 18 or 19 years old. Um, I just was a prolific reader of anything, you know, I did. The Hardy Boys books, and then my sister would have Nancy Drew, and I'd read that too. I would read literally and anything that was between two covers. So I think I, I started just loving the printed word. I loved the experience of reading, uh, and it wasn't until a little bit later on that I really got sort of uh, exposed to philosophy and uh, even even this sort of genre of self help. I remember when I graduated from high school. My aunt gave me a copy of Man's Search for Meaning, which was probably the first book in this kind of genre uh, that I guess I'm in now that sort of exposed me to, you know, that a, that a book could be more than entertainment, that a book could sort of really not just teach you about a specific thing, like, you know, a book about gardening or a book about how to use a computer, but, but a book about how to, how to sort of actualize as a human being. Um, that that was probably the book that sort of opened my eyes the most, or at least at first. And you wrote your first book when you were how old? 20, 24. I wrote an expose of, of the marketing industry, which I had been in for several years um, after college. And uh, I, I started writing when I was 24. I think it came out right after I turned 25. Got it. And so... You have all these books behind you. You're a New York Times best-selling author, you, you know, and you're you're also seen as one of the top philosophers out there right now. Um, I enjoy your Daily Stoic, and for those who want to find you there, they can go to www.dailystoic.com, sign up, get his daily, get Ryan's daily newsletter. It's really, really um, 
it's so informative and actually really inspirational to get that every day. But what prompted you then to now go into this, what is going to be, I believe, your, um, you know, the series that you're going to be writing, The Four Cardinal Virtues. You started with Courage is Calling. What then prompted you to take on these four virtues now and start with Courage? So um, my first book of philosophy was this book I wrote called The Obstacle is the Way, um, which I, I didn't really have much in the way of plans for. I thought, you know, I wanted to talk about this sort of very specific way of thinking about Stoic philosophy aimed at a very specific thing, which is sort of the obstacles that life rolls in our path. And uh, it, 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 it was my sort of first, I, I might say, my breakthrough book. Um, and I, I followed it shortly thereafter with another book, uh, which I had been thinking about before Obstacle came out, um, but ended up becoming more of a sequel to Obstacle than I had intended. Um, or, or at least that I had planned for. So um, one book became two books, and then and then the third book in that trilogy, which came out in 2019, was called Stillness is the Key. So I sort of backed in unintentionally to this three book series, um, although none of, none of it was planned as far as what follows each book. So there's sort of three independent but related books. And so as I was thinking about what I wanted to do next, um, I was thinking about doing a book on courage. I was interested in the topic. And then, you know, the fact that courage is the first of the four cardinal virtues really excited me, not just because that goes to the core of what Stoic philosophy is about, but I liked the challenge of having to try to do a series. And so, um, as a, obviously, philosophically, very interested in, in the sort of the idea of courage and, and its relation to the other virtues. As a writer, I was also excited by the challenge of tackling something as complex as a four book series. So when you were going into this, um, you took on courage first because you believe it's central to the Stoic, Stoic virtues or? Well, so the, 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 the cardinal virtues are the cardinal virtues of both Stoicism and Christianity. Okay. They go sort of way back thousands of years, courage, temperance, justice, wisdom. These are the sort of the the, uh, cardinal comes from the, the Latin cardos, which just means hinge. Yes. So these are sort of pivotal virtues. Yes. So uh, they, they, I've, I've written about them many, many times before. I just had never written a book about them. Right. And so, you know, there could you do one book on all four virtues, like a four part book on the on uh, on on all four virtues? Or would you decide to tackle it as four distinct books? I was excited about doing that. And then. I started with courage. Um, one, it tends to be what is listed first. Like when when you list them, uh, we move the order around, but but typically courage comes first. I think it's the most essential of all the virtues in that you cannot have temperance or justice or wisdom without courage. Um, you really can't have any of the virtues without each other. But I but I think courage is sort of the buy in on on all of the virtues. So it just felt like the right place to start. A lot of this stuff is kind of an intuition, right? Like when when someone says, "Oh, why did you just I had to write a book about this?" or "Why you just you just sort of learn as an artist to trust what is interesting to you, what you're thinking about, what you can't not think about." That's really what it is. I mean, uh, honestly, my first book came from the fact that I kept talking about it, and I finally thought, "I'm just going to write a book about this, and then I won't have to talk about it anymore," which is never really how it works, but. But you're just motivated by this this itch that you can't seem to not scratch. When you were when you decided you were going to do this series, before you started writing a word on courage, did you already have in your mind which book you thought you thought hasn't you haven't done them all yet? It was going to be the more difficult challenge to write. Certainly, I mean, I thought courage would probably be the easiest. Like courage okay. is is right down the middle as far as um, what it is, how you illustrate it and why people uh, care about it, right? Like right. there's no society on earth, right. past or present, that does not hold up cur courage as an admirable thing, right? There's no, there's no uh, society, uh, <laughs> the ancient culture of X that celebrated its cowards, right? Like this, that doesn't exist. So, right. so cur courage, courage felt the most red meat of all of them. Um, I'm, I'm in the middle of the self-discipline book uh, right now, or temperance. Okay. Uh, which is which is proven to be trickier than I thought, but also sort of straight down the middle. I think justice will probably be the hardest book. Yeah. Um, 
One, because it veers the closest into politics, right? Yeah. It's it's the most clear, clearly based on a sense of right and wrong, which obviously there's a lot of disagreement about. Right. Um, so 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 that's probably the book that I am I am most intimidated by. And then the the one that that I have the most reservations about is the wisdom book. Um, in that writing a book about wisdom, all the books have this, but writing a book about wisdom, it still feels a tad presumptuous uh, to be writing about that topic. So, so the wisdom book ha has, has its uh, perils for different reasons. You know, in, in your book, and again, for our listeners and viewers out there, Courage is Calling, Fortune Favors the Brave, Ryan Holiday, he's with us today. This is going to be actually our Thanksgiving edition of the Impact Podcast, because I think this is really a real a special call to action. And Ryan, you've really written, as you could tell, a book that I've enjoyed tremendously and gotten a lot out of after my 59 years, a lot that I never even learned or even understood before. You've explained it simply and really clearly here with, with illustrative stories. When In the book, you talk about, you, you mentioned that you know, we prize courage maybe the most, mm -hmm. but these Courage is, is in absolute short supply. What's yeah. your definition of courage? And what do you want your readers, uh, listeners to come away with from this great book? Well, the definition uh, that I have in the book, um, first stipulating that we, we tend to see there, uh, uh, there being two types of courage, what we call moral courage and physical courage, right? Physical courage is pretty obvious. You know, that's the courage of a soldier uh, or a fireman or something. Um, moral courage is more the courage of a whistleblower or a scientist or a, a you right. know a groundbreaking artist or something. Right. Um, but I think what what both those forms of, of courage share is a willingness to put one's self on the line for something or someone. So I think at the core of courage is obviously the idea of risk. If there is no risk, if the outcome is guaranteed, you know, courage uh, it is obviously not in play. R risk is, is courage is predicated on there being some form of danger, reputationally to your actual health, you know, whatever it is. Um, it, it, if, if the company is guaranteed to succeed, it's not courageous to go start it. Right, right, right. You know, one of, the, one of my favorite things that you did in the book is you gave all these illustrative examples of courage, and you mentioned and quoted so many great people. I made a little game of it. I started writing down just like a my oh, list wow. of every of everyone that you were that you you gave some great stories and quotes from. And one of my favorite stories that I relate to the times that we're living in right now is you gave a, 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 a you you brilliantly explained the Kitty Genovese story, mm -hmm. and I, you know. Kitty Genovese, as you explained it, you know, and the, and the neighbor that came to her rescue put herself on the line when no one else was doing anything is so relatable to what we just went through in, in 2020 with George Floyd and just a mm -hmm. few weeks back on that train in Philadelphia with the woman who was brutally attacked. And it's, it's, it's um, you know, unfortunately, as, 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 you, as you pointed out, History will repeat itself unless we learn from those mistakes. And and um, and and when you hear about or, or read or watch the news about the, these those kind of recent things, do you just shake your head and just you know when people say see something, um, uh, say something? Why not see something, do something? <laughs> sure, right? Well, I, yeah, I think in the as it pertains to that expression, the idea of saying something is doing something, right? But, I think it's interesting when you look at the, the Kitty Genovese story, you know, it it is this sort of shameful story that we've told ourselves about, you know, the indifference of neighbors, particularly in like the sort of the modern city, which it, it was in some ways. And then in other ways, it you know, she was held by a neighbor as she died, uh, right. a neighbor who, who she knew quite well, um, who had left her apartment and her small child inside to go. Uh, answer these screams and finds you know her dying sort of neighbor there, and then asks for zero credit or recognition for this you know uh, this sort of uh, this experience, um, even as she is implicated 
uh, you know, for a generation as being part of, you know, this this horrible tale of indifference to to and inhumanity. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know why that happens. I mean, you think about the the girl who won the Pulitzer Prize for taking the the video of George Floyd. I mean, it wasn't just that uh, she took the video. I mean, um, she stood there filming the police uh, who 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 may you know clearly were not wonderful human beings, so they wouldn't have been in the mur the, the middle of murdering uh, this this man. Um, it. it it's it's more as you said. It's more than just sort of seeing something, but doing something about it. Trying to take some active step towards solving a problem. I think what's interesting about that the George Floyd thing is you have you know the the woman filming it who obviously sees something wrong, but you have the two other officers just standing there or or kneeling there as this as this their boss does this horrible thing right in front of them. Um, there's a, a line from Marcus Aurelius where he says, you know, you can commit injustice by doing nothing also. And it's, of course, easy to say, this isn't my problem. This isn't my fight. This isn't up to me. I don't care about this. But you are complicit in the outcome of what happens. And what makes it worse to me is in that situation, in the recent Philadelphia train um, uh, attack situation, is back in the Kitty Genovese days, Genovese days, people could have said, well, I didn't hear her. I wasn't at home that night. This is now a world of we're all become sort of uh, democratized reporting. And now yeah. people have cell phones. Yeah. And so the fact we know people were there and people were watching, they were filming it. And so that yeah. to me even compounds the complicity, like you said, of inaction. Yeah, I, th I think I think that's right. And 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 maybe that's that. That, that should remind you that like, hey, uh, people are always watching and that right. one ought to go through the world acting as if someone is watching. I, I So you mentioned the Daily Stoic email, yeah. um, uh, the I email today that we sent out to the list. Obviously, I write them in advance, but right. the, 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 the point of today's email was talking about how, you know, your children and your grandchildren are going to ask you about what you did and what the pandemic was like, right? Mm -hmm. And and so just in the same way that, you know, I asked my grandfather about D-Day and I asked, you know, my grandmother about the depression, um, you're gonna ask them about, they're gonna ask you about this historical event, right? And what are you gonna be able to say? Are you gonna say, well, you know, I, I posted a lot of misinformation on Facebook about it, <laughs> right? right. Um, or, or are you gonna say like, hey, you know, I volunteered in a vaccine clinic or, you know, we we uh, we did X, Y, or Z. We kept you guys home. Uh, you know, we 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 did. You know, Bob, what are you going to be able to say, right? Are you when when your kids ask you and you start to describe your experiences in this time, are you going to seem like you were part of the problem, or are you going to seem like you're part of the solution, and uh, or are you going to seem sort of wildly out of touch? Like there's a there's a famous exchange with John F. Kennedy. Um, where where John F. Kennedy sort of admits that um, he'd learned about the Great Depression in Harvard. Like he was so rich and his life was so sheltered that he missed the Great Depression. And, and you know, he wasn't five. He was like 15 during right. the Great Depression, right? right? And, <laughs> and so you're like, oh, wow. Okay, so this person, like they weren't part of the problem in in but they were also part of the problem, right? Like they, 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 this is exactly the kind of out of touchness that probably caused the Great Depression to begin with. And so as we kind of think about how history is going to judge us, both like the larger scale of history, but just also your future self, what are you going to think about yourself in 10 years, right? Um, hopefully society will have progressed in 10 years. Hopefully we'll be kinder and gentler and more equitable, all these things, right? And when you look back at where you were, you're going to be like, oh, you know what I mean? I, I, I didn't do everything that I could. You know, you, you talk about in the book, you give some great examples. And of course, you mentioned one of my heroes, Pat Tillman, mm -hmm. and how we're all going to be called yes. different times in our lives. But we have to be ready to answer that calling. And the calling could be, as you pointed out, 
and you gave so many brilliant examples throughout the book. One of the great examples was the six second example uh, of with 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 our with our brave troops that that prevented many more people from dying over in the uh, the other side of the planet. But with Pat Tillman. He answered his calling, and he said, you know when you get called, you can feel it. Can you explain to our listeners and readers, what do you mean by that, and how can we get better in tune with ourselves so when we know we have to make, we have to exhibit courage, we can actually get over our fear and over ourselves? So, so everyone gets the call, but almost everyone refuses the call, right? If you're familiar with the idea of the hero's journey, which Joseph yep. Campbell puts forth, Yep. One of the steps in the hero's journey is the refusal of the call, right? right? So this is part of it, right? We have this sense, or we hear this voice, or we see this inspiration that calls us to do something. And almost invariably, we come up with reasons why we can't do it, or we can't do it right now. Right. Stephen Pressfield calls this the resistance, right? We don't say, I'm never going to do it. We say, I'll start tomorrow, right? So, so I think it, understanding that this sort of tension, like if, if it was obvious, everyone would do it, right? It's not obvious, it's hard, and right. we wrestle with it. Right. Um, you know, for me, when I dropped out of college to become a writer, when I decided to go from writing books, or writing marketing books to philosophy books, these were not easy or obvious decisions. The, I, I went back and forth about them. I had a lot of doubts about them. Um, but you sort of have to go towards that scarier thing, right? Um, so it, it, the call is there. The call is usually, at, you know, we're coming up on Halloween here. The call is coming from inside the house, right? Um, <laughs> but, but you have to answer. You have to decide to act on it. Um, because what would a world look like without the Pat Tillmans or the Florence Nightingales or the Winston Churchills or the Martin Luther Kings, right? Martin Luther King is just an ordinary uh, pastor in Birmingham, uh, no, in Montgomery. And, you know, he doesn't have to get involved. There were other Black preachers in major Black churches that didn't step forward, right? And there were some that just stepped forward, but not as far as King did. Right. So uh, and to think I think he's 25 years old, like he is, you know, not he's not Mar like you, you, we often think you, know, you 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 think of Thomas Jefferson or George Washington as old men, but they were in their early 20s and 30s when this happened. Um, and so so, you know, uh, they weren't certain about it. It was scary as hell, but they proceeded anyway. They answered the call. They answered the call. Um, you know, you talk a, a, in the book about um, your own fear. And as you just pointed out, switching from a marketing guy to a, a philosopher, dropping out of college, I dropped out of law school. Uh, it, wa it wasn't an easy decision. Of, of course, you know, was, you know the, the, the abyss is always sc scarier totally. than where you are today. Um, what do you want? You know, when there's so many amazing quotes in this in this book, and as you can see, I've marked it up. But anyone who can quote both uh, uh, Martin Luther King and Frank Serpico in a book is, uh, is is someone that I'm a huge fan of. You know, I took out so many quotes and I wrote down so many. What would be your favorite two or three quotes in the whole book that you want people to sear in their to sear in their brain and keep front of front of their brain every day as they work through their journey? So one of the ones I love, it's, it's often attributed to Andrew Jackson, uh, although he probably didn't actually say it, but it's this idea that one person with courage makes a majority. So, you know, uh, the whole world depends on people who stood alone on a certain issue and brought other people around. Again, to go to Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King was, I think, at a 60 or so percent disapproval, uh, you know, uh, disfavorable opinion at the time of his death. You know, not even a majority of African Americans uh, were uh, a fan of Martin Luther King. But this is what happens when you are ahead of your time: is that you often upset people, or you're hard to wrap your head around. And so the idea that that it's going to require standing alone, right? And it's not always as as high stakes as civil rights. It might just be, hey, this is the direction that I think my industry is going to go in. 
And everyone on your team might be convinced you are completely wrong. Um, and that may be why you have to break out on your own or why you have to put in more of your own money on it or, or whatever it is. But the, the point is being okay standing alone, having the courage to do that and, and the, the, the perseverance to understand that this is how uh, change happens from right. a person who, who takes a position and convinces other people to come along with them. Um, one of my favorite ones though, and I think we're in the middle of this right now, uh, is although courage is rare, even amongst people who think they understand courage, uh, we have trouble understanding what it's about. So there's a, a, a quote from the poet, uh, Lord Byron, that I have towards the end of the book. He says, "'Tis the cause makes all that hallows or degrades courage in its fall." Um, is it courageous that Kyrie Irving is willing to risk $400,000 a game to not get vaccinated? Uh, you know, because he's protesting vaccine mandates or whatever. I mean, it's certainly risky, right? That's certainly a, a, a scary thing to do, right? You're, you're, you're betting millions of dollars on a thing you believe. The problem is when we're talking about courage as a virtue, um, it has to be in the pursuit of what the Stokes would call the right. So say, right? to, to courageously protect your right to be a vector of a deadly virus you know, uh, is is not what we're talking about when we're yeah. talking about courage. Was it courageous for Robert E. Lee to break with the country that he had served honorably for years to side with the state of Virginia? Um, was he courageous under fire many times? Of course, but we also understand, and this is why we're having this debate now about these statues, that there's something empty and, ho and, and hollow, not hollow, hollow about the, this courage because it was in the pursuit of a monstrous injustice, a right. monstrously incorrect cause. And so when we think about the virtues, we have to understand that they're related to each other. Not only does courage have to be balanced uh, by justice, it also has to be balanced by wisdom. So if you've courageously decided to jump off a cliff that everyone told you you're going to die when you hit the ground, <laughs> It, you know, this is where wisdom comes in. The wisdom to accept information and integrate it uh, is really, really important. And so, yes, you can courageously resist vaccines as much as you want. But if you're the reason you're doing that is because you're also, again, to go to Kyrie Irving, a person who believes the world is flat. You know, you're an, you're an idiot. You're not right. brave. Right. And that's that's an important. And the bookend on the Kyrie Irving story to me is Muhammad Ali. He was a mm -hmm. hero because he had the courage to. Put, put, push back against a war that he didn't believe in. Sure. And it turned out that history was on his side and he lost a lot of his career because of that. Yes, yes. And look, there's a also, even, even if he was wrong, like there were there were conscientious objectors in the Second World War. I think we 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 go like, look, the, the cause itself was not bad, but we understand there's a severe, uh, uh, sorry, a sincere religious conviction behind the resistance, right? And so even if, uh, Vietnam was not a, a, a travesty or a tragedy in Muhammad Ali. There is a sincere religious conviction that is motivating the decision that he's making, right? So um, it went, it, it's just important to, to say that courage is not, like courage is truth telling, but if you're just rudely telling truths to hurt people's feelings, you know, that's not what we're talking about. Right. Um, again, we've got Ryan Holiday with us. This is the Thanksgiving special. We all should give thanks for Ryan and his new book, Courage is Calling, Fortune Favors the Brave. We could all use wisdom on how to be more courageous in our lives. Every one of us. You know, Ryan, one of the things I love about the book is you talk, you know, a, a lot about the Stoics, obviously, mm -hmm. which you're a philosopher. What do you think if the Stoics were here today, they came down for just two days here on this planet and saw everything that was going on, what would they be intrigued about and, 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 be, and be fascinated by? And what would they be totally um, turned off about what's going on uh, right now? Well, so, so let's say you dropped Marcus Aurelius into right. 2020, right? Right. right. So here you have a guy who was uh, head of state during the beginning of the decline of the Roman Empire, yeah. right? who's also the majority of his reign is uh, made up of what we now refer to as the Antonine Plague. 
right? right? So I feel like he'd have looked around and accepting some of the technology, been like, this is very familiar to me, right? He 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 would understand. And and actually, that's one of my favorite quotes in meditations. It, it, and it certainly became more so over time. But he talks about how during a plague, he says, there's two types of plagues. He says, there's the, there's the pestilence that destroys your life. And he says, there's another that affects your character, right? And I think we've seen this also during the pandemic where people who, whether they got COVID or not, also got some sort of character infection, right? That made <laughs> them, you know, sort of deeply selfish or susceptible to conspiracies or, or just, you know, when you, when you watch a video of some lady you know, screaming at a supermarket clerk who asked them to put on a, ma a mask, you're like, you might not have COVID, you, but you're pretty sure you got something worse, right? Like you, you caught something. Right. Um, and, and, and so, you know, that, that Marcus was familiar with that 2000 years ago, I find to be really interesting. Right. Um, I do think, you know, I said, accepting the technology, I do think they would be uh, appalled by our dependency on these devices, right? That our our inability to to focus for five minutes on yeah. the simplest of tasks, I, I think I think they would struggle to comprehend that. I mean, obviously, uh, human beings have always struggled with attention and focus and whatever, but um, I think they'd look at, at 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 our dependency on these devices and 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 ask why we're doing this to ourselves. Got it. You know. Um... One of the things I loved about your journey, and you're only 34, which, you know, my two children are above me here and this, and this is this was up on my walls for years before this pandemic ever hit, but it turned out to be a nice background for all my Zoom calls. Yeah. My daughter's 34, and she's a lawyer, and I'm so proud of her, but I mean, I mean, she's 35, and I think, oh my gosh, I mean, at such a young age, you've, you've done so much, and now during the pandemic, you are called again, you know, when all of retail shut down or virtually all of retail, you decide to go counter to the absolute trends that are existing in 2020, which was literally a silence that I've never seen in my 59 years on the, in the United States and around the world. And you opened up a bookstore called The Painted Porch in your hometown now, you're where you live in Bastrop, Texas. Explain what, where that calling came from, why you decided that 2020 during the pandemic was the right time to answer the call and how's it gone since you launched this? And I've been online, I've seen the bookstore, all the photos, and it looks just gorgeous and beautiful and something out of a Norman Rock, Rockwell uh, painting. Why? Well, I, so to be fair, I started before the pandemic. I okay. just decided not to quit during the pandemic, right? I think uh, if you had told me- okay. You know, I didn't decide in March that okay. opening a bookstore Fair would enough. be a good idea. Fair enough. Fair but, enough. but I did stand in the empty bookstore in March and go, I can't believe we we have to do this now. Right. And so <laughs> it was a it was a long journey. It was an exhausting, it was an expensive and uh terrifying journey in many ways. Um, but it, it, it was a really good experience. So the weird thing, uh, I love books. You can see books behind me. I, I love physical books most of all. That's how I uh, read. Um, but but now, even as an author, something like 60% of my book sales are digital, right? Either uh, eBooks or, or audiobooks. Right. Obviously, I'm very grateful for that. But something about the physical experience really means something to me. And and as as we were looking, we were looking for some office space for our company, we sort of came up with this hybrid idea of office space plus, you know, there was a storefront involved. And so it, it worked out it somewhat accidentally as an as an opportunity to do both. Um, and it is it's turned out to be very cool uh, and fun. Um, it was harder and took longer than expected, but it's been a really cool experience. And, and there's something about being part of a community, be doing something in the real world, um, you know, I can hear right now, like little kids running around, you know, uh, right. excited. There's just something I, I love about that. Hey, listen, I, I love it. I, I grew up in New York City, and one of my favorite places of peace and enjoyment was Fifth Avenue and 18th Street, the, the big Barnes & Noble, the, 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 their flagship store. So opening sure. up a bookstore sounds wonderful. Just during a pandemic, maybe not so yeah. much, but how's it? It was not the best business decision, but it's been a fun uh, personal 
experience to say the least. Talking about personal experiences, you're married with two boys. Yes. You no, know, you know, and I know you take that seriously. I've, re- I've, re- I've read what you've written about fatherhood and being a, a husband. And I know you don't, uh, you know, I know you really lean into it. How do you find time given how busy you are, how much you love to read and also your writing, you're already writing the second in the, of this four series, the book on temperance. Where do you find time to get into your flow and actually still continue to to be at the peak of your your abilities? I mean, it's a it's a it's kind of an unfair profession. I mean, like if I was a professional baseball player, I would be away a lot more. Right. I would be dependent on other. It, one of the benefits and part probably why I chose it, but you know, you're sort of a lone wolf as a writer as far as doing your actual thing. Um, and, and so you're able to kind of squeeze it in into different pockets. But, you know, I'm, I'm a big creature of habit. Part of the reason we did the bookstore, part of the reason we live where we live was kind of right. setting up a system to optimize for those things that allowed all of them to be possible. You know, if I had a, if I had a 90 minute commute uh, or something, obviously that would eat up large chunks of the time in the day. So I, I've tried to sort of design my life around the things that are important to me. But it also means, you know, saying no to sort of stuff that maybe would ordinarily be perks of the profession to a single writer my age or something. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not experiencing, but but that hasn't been something I've, I've particularly missed. Right, right. Um, you know, uh, one of my favorite quotes in your book is, the world is a narrow bridge and the important thing is not to be afraid. Yes. Explain why you put that in the book and what that means to you and why that was so important to put that. that yeah, it's it's book. a little Hebrew prayer. Um, yeah. There's actually a great novel called uh, The World is a Narrow Bridge by a, a guy named uh, Aaron Thayer, uh, okay. which I love as well. But but to me, what the, the, the wisdom of that prayer is, it's like, you know, when you're walking, if you've ever been on like a narrow rope bridge or something over like some canyon, it's just like, just keep walking. Don't look down. Don't look over the edge. Don't stop. You know, don't look behind you. Sure. Just get across the bridge. Right. And and any of those other things, as tempting as they might be, are uh, are very uh, dangerous. Right. Because you slow down, you lose your heart to continue, suddenly get really nervous. Right. You just you just got to get across. Got it. And um you know, in, in, in a lot of your writings that I've read before, before even Courage is Calling, you talk about the Stoics' virtue of contr- controlling their response, how mm-hmm. we can all learn to be better at controlling our response. What do you want people to learn when you write about controlling their response and how the Stoics held that in high esteem and how we can all get better at practicing that and actually exhibiting that kind of behavior? Well, I think, look, at the core of Stoicism is the idea that we don't control what happens. We control how we respond. That's that's right. the that's life. Right. 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 Um, and so I think if you think about it just as a resource allocation issue, are you going to spend time on the things you don't control? Or are you going to put all that energy towards the parts of it that you do control? So I think Stoic just tries to say, what part of this is up to me? What can I do? Where can I move the ball forward? And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. On, on the contrary, I just know, like it is, sometimes you get all worked up at something and you're like, well, what am I really saying here? And what you're really saying is, I wish that it hadn't happened this way, right? But it did. And so are you going to spend time litigating that or are you going to focus on what comes after? Yeah, you made a point in the book where you said, or in your book or somewhere else when I read one of your passages, where you said, Rarely do you ever feel excited or do you look back favorably on a time where you um, got mad or got exploded at somebody or something? Sure. It never, it never, you never, it's, it's, it's not fun to look back at those moments. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think I've ever lost my temper and then been proud of myself after. Right. right. Are, are there certain moments where I'm glad I stood up for myself? Yeah. But even yeah. in those moments, I say, you know, I, w- I, I, I wish I'd done that without saying X, Y, or Z. Right. 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 You know, you get to meet a lot of people, like you said, because of your, you know, over 4 million copies you've sold, Ryan, you're a New York Times bestseller many times over, athletes, entertainers, and so many leaders, military leaders around the world read your books. So you have great access to so, so many people. What I'd love to know is if tonight, 
and tomorrow night. You had two chances at dinner. One tonight with someone who is still living, not a family member, sure. to go to dinner with somebody. And tomorrow night with someone who's passed, anyone who's passed. Who would be the, your two favorite people to have dinner with, passed and still alive? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to meet uh, General Mattis, uh, who I'm a, I'm a big fan of, and I know a little bit, but I'm, we've never met in person. So okay. uh, if I had to pick a living, maybe I'd go there. Um, and then if if I, I mean, I feel like I would lose my stoic credentials if I didn't choose Marcus Aurelius. Uh, yeah. But but if I had to pick, let's say let's say you're limiting it to an American, I, I think Lincoln probably could be Lincoln. anyone. No, yeah. no, it's not American. No, no, I'm just saying. Yeah, I, I, to, yeah so I can choose did. two. I'd right, say okay. Marcus Aurelius right. number you one. Got it. You got a bonus one in there. Yes, I see what you did. Exactly. Okay. You, you limited. You self-limited it. I got yes. it. I got it. Um, you know, you you you. Um, and again, courage is calling. You can buy this book not only at the Painted Porch, but at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, and every other place you can buy. Uh, you know, great books. This is just really one of the favorite books that I've read in ten years. You can see how much I've marked it up. You know, you talked about David Brooks in the book. You talked about the second mountain. Can you share yeah. a little bit about what you mean about the uh, Brooks? What Brooks meant by the second mountain? Yeah, the second mountain is uh, he says sort of once you climb to the top of the first mountain, that's your career success. What yeah. is the second mountain for you? What do you what are you sort of giving back? What is the other thing that you're doing? Um, yeah. He's a great book uh, by that title. I think I think it's up there. Um, <laughs> uh, Anyways, I, I'm going to talk about that more probably in the Justice book. But to me, this this the second mountain, the bookstore was part of the second mountain, right? Was like, hey, um, right. I've had this success. This is a thing I'm good at. What is a cool thing I could do in a place that I live? What's an, what's another project to tackle that might not be as financially lucrative, but might be richer in meaning or purpose? Um, and uh, and it's certainly been that. So I think the second mountain is sort of what are the what are the what is what is it that you are doing after you have achieved the thing that uh, you wanted most in the world? Got um, it. And, you know, I love that you talk about in, well, first of all, you talk, you share some stories that I've never heard. I mean, I love the story that you shared. I, and if you want to just hit the high notes on it, I think it would be fun for our listeners and viewers on, on the relationship between Martin Luther King and Richard Nixon, which I had never read that or heard that anywhere, and the relationship between JFK and Martin Luther King and how two phone calls could have probably turned that whole election. Yeah, so so Nixon and King were actually friends because Nixon was in charge of Eisenhower's uh, civil rights platform. And so they met each other many, many times. Um, and then, uh, you know, Kennedy did not really know uh, uh, King until the 1960 election and, and and King is arrested in Georgia on these sort of trumped up charges. And there's a real concern that he's either gonna do a long prison sentence or he's gonna mysteriously disappear while in police custody, right? He's gonna be murdered or lynched. Right. And so Coretta Scott King, who's pregnant, I think with her third child at the time, calls both campaigns and says, you guys gotta do something. You can't let my husband die. Um, you know, uh, both parties had some civil rights, uh, you know, uh, uh, planks in, the, in their in their campaign. And so um, Nixon decides not to get involved. He doesn't want to be seen as grandstanding. He wants to wait until after the election. He also doesn't want to lose uh, some of the Southern vote. It's a sort of razor thin there anyway. He doesn't want to lose the Southern vote. So he doesn't get involved. And Kennedy, on the other hand, decides uh, mostly at the at the prompting of his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, right. to place a phone call, one to Coretta Scott King, and then he and his brother both called the judge in Georgia, and they, they ultimately sort of apply enough pressure that, that King is released. Um, and 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 uh, Martin Luther King, when he gets out of jail, he's like stunned. He he would have sworn that it would have been Nixon who would have helped him, not Kennedy, who's a Democrat. Who is more dependent on Southern Democratic support, right? Uh, and, and and so he sort of he's just puts out there what happened, and he, and he he changed he'd been planning to vote for Nixon, and he changes his mind. And uh, I think Kennedy goes on to win the presidential election by like thirty thousand votes across three states, um, almost entirely uh, people think due to to the swing in the black vote due to this 
two phone calls two that phone- he makes. And so I, I think it's an important example of how a single but 30 second burst of courage can change one's life. And conversely, that a uh, a momentary lapse of courage, right? A moment of cowardice can change your life for the negative as well, right? Like Nixon doesn't get involved because he doesn't want to hurt his reelection prospects and ends up costing himself the election. So, um, you know, we when we have these moments when our conscience is telling us what to do and we feel that pit in our stomach, you just got to do it. You got to answer the call. Yes. You know, um, I love in you. You know, you know, you you're very self-reflective. You know, Ryan, and you you put in the. I, I really enjoy the afterward. I, I you know I I have you know I have to tell you the afterward was really interesting to me. I never heard that story. Never read all that. I had just seen the business side of that story. Never understood the underpinnings. It's the American Peril, your involvement with American Peril, and as you said, com, you know, you've already pointed out during this interview and, and other places, complicity is 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 just as bad as um, you know uh, 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 as any sure. you know. So, but I love when you write about yourself, like thirty four mistakes on the way to thirty four years old. Is yeah. that? Do you enjoy the process of being so self reflective and unvarnished? Is it a cathartic, a cathartic experience for you, or do you find it's informative? to the platform that you've created, or is it is it a duality in both? I think it's both. I mean, I, I do think as far as counter-programming goes, most people celebrate their successes and talk only, show a very selected picture of sort of who they are and how things are going. Yeah. And, and, and I cer- certainly understand this for branding purposes, but it's also kind of boring, right? Because yeah. everything's positive, everything's going well, nothing feels particularly real. Um, so I do try to to sort of consciously make an effort to sort of show how things actually are. And I think people appreciate that. Um, but I also feel like, you know, it's just really easy to buy into your own crap, right? And so I try to sort of consciously like look at things uh, like I did in this story. You know, I, I could have told some sort of narrative that presented myself as a particularly courageous person, or I could have shown all the things all... But I don't know. It just didn't feel right. It, it, I talked earlier about intuition. There was just a part of me that said, you know, the, the best way to wrap up this book would be with a story of cowardice or a, a failure of courage, as opposed to, you know, somehow trying to coast or ride on the coattails of these people whose stories you've just told. So it just felt right. And it, it, I certainly benefited from the experience of reflecting on it as well. But part of it also just, it just felt like the honest thing to do. You know, before I let you go today, Ryan, I want to talk about two fascinating um, uh, shows that that really hit it big during this this pandemic. One was The Last Dance with Michael Jordan, the 10-part series. Right. In the episode, I believe it was episode eight, at the the last part of it, the last four or five minutes, it was the only time he got emotional during the whole interview. And he had a quote. Uh, and this is when he literally started breaking. And I, it's yeah. there to see him break. He said at the end of episode eight, leadership has a price and winning has a price. If, yeah. we, if we replace the words leadership and winning with the words courage, do you find that that, that analogy is, is absolutely spot on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, like when you look at whistleblowers, uh, yeah. I had, um, I had, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, who's the whistleblower? Uh, oh, I had Lute- Lieutenant Colonel uh, Vindman on my okay. podcast, the, the, right. the, the, the White House whistleblower. You know, you look at what that decision cost that guy. It cost him, not only him, his, his, uh, his military career, but it cost his brother his career as well. Mm-hmm. So, so these things don't come for free, right? They, they come at a cost. And uh, I, think, I think that's right. Um, but that's what makes it so impressive. Again, if 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 it was free, if it was easy, everyone would do it, and there'd be a lot more Michael Jordans, and thus there'd be no Michael Jordans. You know, we all grew up, you know, especially during this pandemic, Moderna uh, became one of the great brands now that we all yeah. know about because they had a breakthrough technology with Pfizer to come up with this the great vaccination. But we all look back then to Jonas Salk, and you mentioned Jonas Salk in the book, and now yeah. I always knew him for, of course, creating 
you know, the, the polio vaccine. I never knew until I read your book that he didn't patent it and he didn't, you know, again, personally yeah. take advantage of that great breakthrough. Well, there is a, there's another woman, her, her, her name is Dr. Katarine Carrico, and she uh, has been, had been working on mRNA vac- uh, uh, research for like 30 years. She came to America as an immigrant from Hungary with $900 in her pocket. She never made more than $60,000 a year. She constantly had to fight for her funding. She's constantly having to fight for her job. You know, everyone thought this was this sort of scientific dead end. And then lo and behold, 2020 comes around and suddenly it's the ticket and it's the invention uh, you know, of a lifetime uh, or the breakthrough of a lifetime. And so look, we need, we need it, that wasn't easy for her, right? And it, I'm sure it took a lot out of her and I'm sure it took a lot out of her family. Um, but we need people like that. And where would we be without people like that, right? Um, right. It, it's, it's almost uh, unfathomable. So my last question for today, and then I'm going to leave you, of course, because yeah. you've been so generous, is, is about our is about our the new hero of the world, Ted Lasso. Yes. Jason, so Jason Sudakis, you know, he he was being interviewed the other day, and they said, "Listen, how did you come up with such an amazing an idea to execute into this series when your life was sort of falling apart? Your you and your uh, wife had split." You yeah, were, you were separated from your children and stuff. And he talked about it. He said, listen, you have a choice. And you talk about this choice in the book. He, he said, you have a choice. You could either become when 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 the world crushes you and it's going to crush you. All of us are going to somewhere somehow get knocked down or beat up or crushed. He goes, you can become a pile of 206 bones, you know, or, or you can um, and broken bones, which means he goes, it's all your bones are broken. If we all have 206 bones, he goes, that means you're a pile of 400 plus bones, or you can put yourself back together, get up and move forward every day. And if you do it right, the bones have come together and healed even stronger than when you started. And you talked about the Japanese art called Kintsugi, I think it's, it's K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I. Can you talk a little bit about how all of us in some way, shape or form are broken and how we, we can either decide that you know, death is the option or, or we're going to come back stronger and smarter. So what I love about Ted Lasso as a show, and I sort of talk about this a little bit in the book is I love just earnestness, right? Yeah. It's like a positive show. Yeah. It, 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 he actually sincerely tries uh, to be a decent human being instead of this sort of action hero or anti-hero or whatever you want. And I, I love that. I, I think hope is probably the most courageous thing that there is, or just earnestly trying is, you know, one of the most courageous things you can do in this life. So I love that. Um, The art form you're talking about, it's a Japanese form of art where, let's say, a piece of pottery breaks. Instead of gluing it back together, they 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 uh, they 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 uh, attach it either via gold or silver. So the thing becomes not just more valuable as a result, but it becomes more beautiful as a result. It's the it's a it's a fascinating form of art. And I think it's a good metaphor for the human experience. Right. Uh, You can break and become stronger as you heal in the broken places, or you can become weaker and more vulnerable in those places, but that's your choice, right? And I think, um, look, the last year has been really hard. The last year and a half has been really hard. Some of us are gonna emerge from this better, and some of us are gonna emerge from this broken shells of a human being. You you know, you you look at, at, again, you look at some of the ways that people behave now, the, the things they say, you understand, and where it comes from, it's been a rough year and a half. Um, but, you know, the choice is, are we going to be made better, more kind, more loving, more connected, more appreciative, more generous as a result of what's happened? Or are we going to become bitter and angry and aggressive and antisocial as a result of what's happened? That's ultimately to go back to the question about what do you control? That choice is on you. You didn't choose what happened the last year and a half. No one would have chosen it uh, if they did. But it did happen. And so what are you going to emerge looking like? That's the question. Got it. And that's why we're, we're that's why you're here with us today on this Thanksgiving special. We want people to emerge better with more courage. You know, Ryan, I, my, my, my lifelong friend since I'm five years old. So that's 54, 55 years now. Greg Saffer first told me about you. And he's still, of course, my good friend. And he told me about your coins. And this oh, lovely. Coin, and this coin sits underneath my, my speaker here. So when I do all these in, interviews, and at my business desk, I'm always able to remember. But 
Can you just share with our listeners why Memento Mori and you, you could leave life right now means so much as something to, that we all should keep in mind uh, as we move through this journey? Well, I think the point about the pandemic stands, right? Is it yeah. sort of, it put in stark relief how fragile life is, yeah. how, how you really can't take anything for granted, how things can change in an instant. Uh, and, and the Stoics wanted us never to lose sight of that, to remember that we're mortal, to remember that we're not in control, to remember that life has a definite end. Every single person who's born will die. When that is, is an open question, but it could be five minutes from now. It could be 50 years from now. Um, but how are you going to spend that time? Who are you going to be? What decisions are you going to make while you're still you know, in control? The, again, those, those, are the, those are the important questions. And for our listeners and viewers who want to buy these coins, they can go to dailystoic.com, sign up for Ryan's newsletter to buy this book. You can buy it, of course, at The Painted Porch, or you can buy it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all great web, um, uh, bookstores, both physical bookstores and online in the United States and around the world. Courage is calling. Fortune favors the brave. Ryan was kind enough to sign a bunch of copies for us. We're going to be giving them out during our Thanksgiving special Thank you, Ryan Holiday. You are making a huge impact on this planet. You're making, you also made a huge impact on me and my family. Thank you for this time. We're really grateful for all that you're doing. John, thank you so much. Thanks, Ryan. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com.